Hey, welcome to this lesson where we'll talk about the science of vision and in particular two different types of attention that you can access and toggle between using a kind of trick of the eyes that will also shift your state of mind. But first, just starting with the very basic neuroscience of vision. One of the things that's counterintuitive is that our eyes are not recording a perfect copy of an objective external world. In other words, it's often thought or kind of intuitively we feel like the eyes are capturing exactly what's out there. But if we think about other species like bumblebees that see like see ultraviolet, other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, snakes that could see in infrared, bats that, you know, quote unquote, see ultrasound, then their realities are so different than ours. But which one is the real reality? Is what we're seeing real or is what they're saying seeing real? And well, of course, the answer is it's more subjective than that. The brain is cre constructing a reality based on what's useful for these different species for survival and reproduction. And in the way that our visual system evolved, we're no different. So about 40 to 50% of the real estate in the brain is involved in vision. And it's largely like active hallucination in the sense that we're involved in layering on top of the raw information that comes in through our eyes what we think about those objects, what we remember about them, and useful ways of interacting with them. For example, as humans, when we see a like, object that looks like a pen, we perceive a writing utensil, where it's like we're seeing how we would hold it and write with it almost. It's kind of interesting, like you can try this if you just try to look at a pen without thinking about how you would grab it. You know, it's like the mind's already thinking about how it would use that as a tool because we're a species that has used tools for a long time and they've been very helpful. But to a dog, that pen might look like a chew toy and to another species, it might just be, you know, something to avoid knocking into or something to avoid stepping on. So vision is a very active process. It's not passive. And what this also means is that our minds are largely shaping our realities in the sense like we're layering on top much of our state of mind. So for example, if you're in a bad mood and you're looking out at the world, it might seem like a kind of dystopian place, it might seem kind of gray and gloomy. And then if you're in a bright mood or or you got your kind of rose-tinted glasses on because you've just fallen in love. Maybe the world looks beautiful and everything is wonderful, magical. And oh, look at that sunset. Look at that tree. So I think on a practical level, recognizing the fact that vision is constructed largely in the minds can help us empathize with others who see the world differently, literally. And it can also kind of humble us that we don't, we can't be so certain about the way that the world works because ultimately we're, what we're seeing is a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum and then layering on top of that all sorts of guesses and predictions that the brain makes in order to interact with the environment in a way that has benefited it for a long time. And then the other thing that happens with vision is that if we're not aware of where we want to put our attention, there's this bottom-up system of attention that happens where things grab our attention that would have been useful for our survival and reproduction. So these little movements of our eyes that happen about 10 times per second, more or less, these are called saccades. And when the eyes dart off towards something, let's say it suddenly noticed a fly or, you know, we don't usually notice this and I'm not saying we should, it's a little obsessive to notice every little saccade. But what's happening in the brain is that when you pay attention to something and you look at it, you're kind of gathering more information about it. And in this way, attention is amplifying whatever it touches. It becomes more a part of your internal world, more a part of your reality because you're feeding it your attention. And this has a lot of implications for the way that we interact with the world because if we're not careful with what we pay attention to, it really invades our mind. It's like it could become 
a mind virus in a way. If we're feeding attention towards the wrong things, towards a very negative ways of viewing the world, towards material that's going to be toxic to our mental health. So we can train to kind of guard our attention in a way that in the sense of being careful to pay attention where we pay attention and where our where our eyes go, which advertisements we view, and other choices we make throughout the day with our attention system. And this brings us to two different types of attention that we can experience right now. So if you just take one finger, I've sliced this finger, so it's got a little extra tip to it, but just put it in front of you and focus on the tip of your finger and then now relax your gaze and open to the entire panoramic field, the wider field. And you can do this a couple of times, noticing the difference between focusing all of your attention on the tip of your finger to relaxing. And how does your mind feel when you take in the full room or the full environment in front of you compared to when you're focused on just the tip. If you're like me, you might have noticed a relaxation and a a kind of more a spaciousness, literally, but also in in the mind, a kind of opening in the mind as well when the vision went wide. So I call this focused attention versus open attention. And the focused attention mode has been linked to the norepinephrine circuits, it's, it's a more kind of amped up, almost fight or flight way of being. Not that we're going to get like necessarily rev up our nervous system just from focusing on, on something, but if we have prolonged focus on one thing or if we're paying really close attention, that can put us in a state that's slightly stressed out, slightly, slightly more tense, whereas the open attention is more of a relaxed being mode where we're present and alert to more things around us, but in a more receptive way. And interesting is that the brain kind of needed both of these different modes of attention to survive. If you think about a species like a bird that needs to both monitor for potential threats around it, but also peck the little grains on the floor, um, it needs both modes of attention. And the way that birds evolved, they've kind of lateralized these functions. So birds tend to use the left eye, which is associated with the right brain hemisphere, like we talked about yesterday, with a more open attention. So they're kind of using that eye to monitor for maybe predators. And they'll often kind of look at you with that side of the head. And then they use the right eye, which is associated with the left hemisphere, to like eye and zoom in on the pieces of like grains of corn or whatever it is they eat and peck for it so it's a more focused attention. Interestingly, in some of the traditions, there is this emphasis on using a wide and relaxed and unfocused gaze during meditation, especially in, in Dzogchen. There's a modern Dzogchen teacher named Lama Lina who does this kind of eyeball trick thing where she asks you to relax the, the muscles around the eyes and unfocus the gaze. And yeah, you might experience for yourself as you did with this little finger trick that just going into a more relaxed, open gaze, and especially if there's a horizon where you can look out, this tends to be more restful and tends to put you into more of a meditative, present-oriented state and also relax the sense of self. Because when we're in focused attention, there's like a me that's here and then an object over there that I'm in relation to. Whereas when we're in a more open attention, there's less of a duality. There's less of the sense of self and other. So every 30 minutes or so, if you can remember to do this while you're working, if you need to be in a focused attention mode, you might just take a moment to relax your eyes, relax around your eyes, like your jaw, face. And I think this was a a recommendation from Dr. Andrew Huberman that you would do this every so often. I'm going to say like every 30 minutes, you could look up and do this relaxation just to put yourself into a more relaxed 
state of mind and also to physically relax your eyes and give them a rest. And then applying it to the four R's, you can recognize when the eyes lock onto something. And especially if you get like very interested in something that to the point where it's creating a, a negative mental state, maybe it's something alarming that you've just seen or an advertisement, which is, you know, trained to take advantage of this system, then you can have the opportunity to release as we just did with the finger, finger exercise, you widen back out your gaze and you're free from whatever it is that grabbed your attention. And then you might take a moment to further release any tension in your jaw, any tension in your head, any tension around your eyes, and then relish. You can relish that relaxed, open gaze that is kind of subtly blissful and relaxing. And, and then you can remain with a soft, and unfocused gaze as you move about the day uh, when it's not necessary to be focusing on something and this will give you a chance to continue meditating as you move about your day and even as you speak with others it's not to say that locking in and being in focused attention mode is bad it's just that if we can skillfully toggle between the two and notice what which mode we're in it can be helpful and train us to have more mental fitness and to have a little more control over the attentional system with the meta awareness muscle, this observation of the mind and body that allows us to 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 use the to apply the four R's and to meditate all day long. And so the daily challenge is just to recognize whether you're in focused or open attention throughout the day. And notice in particular what causes open attention for you. And I'd be curious if you'd like to comment below what it is that puts you into open attention generally throughout the day. Thanks so much for hearing me out, and I'll see you tomorrow for the last day of this 30-day course on meditation, science, and bliss. Have a great day.